Hello and welcome to today's webinar, um, Identity on a Mobile Device, um, Access Control Use Cases. Today's webinar is being brought to you by the Secure Technology Alliance and in specifically the uh, work of the Identity Council. My name is Randy Vanderhoof. I'm going to serve as the moderator for today's um, webinar. And just a couple of quick notes before we begin. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and attendees will receive a follow-up email after the webinar. It takes us about 24 hours to get that to you. And there'll be a link in that uh, email, which will allow you to access the recording of the webinar, as well as uh, download the copy of the presentation deck that's going to be used. And we also encourage you to share that link and that information to others in your organization who may not have had the opportunity to participate live today. Um, also, GoToWebinar has a question submission feature on the webinar presentation page. And we encourage you to submit questions to the, uh, to the presenters during the webinar so that we can organize them in advance uh, before we start. If we wait so all the questions get submitted at the very end. Uh, it gets difficult for us to be able to sort through them and get the uh, best questions addressed. So the sooner you could send those in, the better for all of us. So let's move to the next slide and do the int introductions. Um, so let me uh, introduce now the, the guest presenters we have. So Tom Lockwood is a senior associate of business development at NextGen ID and a veteran in the government identity and security marketplace. Tom is a board member of the Secure Technology Alliance and also serves as the interim chair of this identity council. Next, we have Neil Fallon, is director of government solutions at HID Global Identity and Access Management Group. Neil has over 30 years experience and uh, professional experience and knows, and he, and he now focuses on securing identities using PKI and two-factor mobile system applications. And thirdly, we have Dr. John Fessler, who is principal engineer at Exponent and has been working in the areas of smart cards, identity, and access control for government applications for the past 16 years. And next slide, please. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the Secure Technology Alliance, um, let me briefly inform you about who we are. So the Secure Technology Alliance is a not-for-profit multi-industry association working to stimulate the understanding, adoption, and widespread application of secure solutions. And we provide in this collaborative member-driven environment education as well as information on how smart cards, embedded chip technology, and related hardware and software can be adopted across all markets in the United States. And as many of you who are familiar with this space knows that mobile technology is increasingly becoming part of the landscape for how uh, identity and access control applications are being deployed in the United States and around the world. If you look to the right, you see our focus is um, access control, which is part of today's discussion, but also areas such as authentication, healthcare, identity management, Internet of Things, mobile, payments, and transportation. So the organization has a broad reach across many different markets and different ways in which uh, security and um, identity management is being applied. And to look at uh, some of the services that we provide, including um, creating a forum to bring together stakeholders to effectively collaborate on promoting secure solutions. Um, we publish white papers, webinars like today, workshops, newsletters, position papers, and we have a very uh, active um, web presence with our website. We also create conferences and other events that focus on these specific markets and technologies, and we offer education programs, training, and even industry certifications to professionals in our field. We provide networking opportunities for professionals to share their knowledge and also to produce uh, industry communications through public relations, web resources, and social media. So now if we go to the next slide, a uh, couple of words to say about the Identity Council, which is the um, work group community within the Secure Technology Alliance that is responsible for the content of today's webinar. So the Identity Council serves as a focal point for the Alliance's identity and 
identity related efforts, leveraging embedded chip technology and privacy and security enhancing software. And that working committee supports a spectrum of physical and logical access use cases and applications, as well as different form factors, attributes, and authentication and authorization methods. And many of those will be on display during today's discussion. If you look to the right, you'll see some of the council resources that the uh, Identity Council has uh, produced or has contributed to, including position papers on identity assurance levels, FICAM, and the, in, the digital identifiers and authentication, identity management and examining use cases for mobile identity, such as driver's licenses, and the role of smart card technology and in mobile applications like the FIDO protocols. So next slide, please. So now I'm going to hand things over to Tom Lockwood, our Identity Council Chair, to give a mobile identity landscape assessment. I'll return at the end of this uh, to lead the Q&A session. Tom? Thank you, Randy. Good afternoon. I'm glad everyone can visit us today and spend a little bit of time on this. Next slide, please. Within the identity space, there's been a number of changes over the, the recent years. Some of the key things that are occurring right now is the identity is moving from a vertical market associated with vertical products, now moving into a horizontal. Specifically, I've noted a number of, of trends that are occurring. Again, we have online, both desktop, mobile, in-person, kiosk machine-based you know, identity exchanges. And again, we see the expansion of the mobile and the kiosk markets. Within these various architectures, within the rate of change, one of the challenges that we have as a community is it's the wild, wild west for the mobile market. Additionally, you'll see some of the other changes within the questionnaire over time. One of the questions is, is what would you like to see your identity council start to add in the roadmap that helps our community you know, in general? As a bottom line on all of this, what we're working to do is to create tangible, necessary, real market relevance products, services, and awareness. Next slide, please. So the problem that we're faced with right now are inconsistent solutions. We have various methodologies, practices, assumptions. Within our approach, we said we have the resources that are part of the alliance. All of the wealth of the different organizations, the subject matter experts, literally just an amazing group of individuals. But beyond that, we have our other teammates with other associations whether that be some of the biometric experts who crossed over with, with IBIA, our communities over in AMVA, they're dealing with DMVs. And again, our strategy is to leverage all of our community as we go forward. Our target audiences we're going forward are people that are really looking at implementing and moving more into a mobile environment, and how do we make it a much, much better user experience. Again, some of these are, we're looking at some best practices, we're working with organization agencies that are executing. But again, our desired outcome is a much better user experience. If we can have the opportunity to highlight some of the best practices, some guidelines, some ways to help enable and make our, our community more consistent in our approaches, that's one of the things that we would really like to do. But the initial step that we found by coming through this process is raising awareness. In webinar number one, we started off with how did you get a trusted identity um, credential? So as we go through some of the core objectives, again, the objectives of the effort in general, and we hope to deliver this over the course of these series of webinars. Again, one of the key roles that we like to do is provide educational, okay, much more consistency in the design build. And again, we're not an, a standards development organization, so we would like to provide some of the findings and recommendations to those other organizations. Again, we're all partners in the same community. Next slide, please. In our approach, it's clearly very collaborative. What we've done is talk to a number of communities, a number of councils, 
to ask them where they see the trends occurring, where are they looking at early implementation, whether it's the healthcare field, the transportation field, banking, what are some of the innovative uses when people are saying we want to use mobile devices to proof people, we want to use mobile devices for wayfinding. We're starting to see some very unique enabling opportunities with the use of mobile phones. Okay. So again, what we're looking to do through this process is looking at a combination of some of the horizontal issues, such as the identity element, the biometrics element, some of the mobile elements, as well as the vertical implementation pieces. Through this process, we hope to identify security, human factors, privacy issues, key technology or architecture issues, and even policy. We hope when we're done to have very clear recommendations. And from that, if the community would like to go in more detail, um, that'll be a decision for the community and the council to take up when we're done. Next slide, please. We very much want to get your feedback. The first webinar, again, webinar number one, this was how did we come up with a trusted identity credential? In this case, we work with AMVA for driver's license and their strategy of moving forward with mobile driver's license on your phone. We've also worked then with the federal government, some of the leaders in the federal government that are looking for a more, more secure architecture to a mobile phone. In today's webinar, we're gonna talk about now how will that identity be consumed in, general, in, in a general sense for fiscal and logical use cases. Webinar number three that will be coming up in September is payment integrity. And I think that is a really interesting opportunity to walk through. Four is very innovative when we walk through the uses of mobile devices. And lastly, in webinar five, how do we tie the mobile devices back over to the backend systems? So again, part of our partners on this has been the airport, the American Association of Airport Executives, the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators, the International Biometric and Identity Association. And again, we very much appreciate the, the teaming and the partnership by the other organizations. Next slide, please. So with this, I wanna pass it over to Neil Fallon. And again, Neil, I just appreciate all the effort in putting this together. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, hello, everyone. So um, next slide, please. The first uh, part of this presentation is a poll. And uh, we'd like you to take this poll for us. Uh, what are your plans for deploying a mobile or derived credential for physical access? And you can read the five different responses. And if you could take that poll now, we'd appreciate it. So here are the results. So 40% have already deployed. That's that's great. So this will be this will be interesting. The next uh, uh, part of this presentation. So next slide. So the first thing you need to discuss here is what are we talking about when we talk about placing an identity onto a mobile device? You know, just what is a mobile device? We have smartphones, tablets, and wearables, right? Next slide. So the smartphone is feature rich. Uh, you can use it for both logical and physical access. And the tablet is on par with the smartphone, but it, because it's a little bit bulkier, it's a little bit harder to carry around. And the wearables are not quite there yet as far as their feature and technology goes to put a credential on. So the next slide, please. So we have decided that um, when we're, for this presentation, we're gonna talk about mobile phones. And the reason's very obvious. Everybody who's listening to this webinar has a mobile phone, and if I asked you to go touch it, you probably could. And if you couldn't touch it, you probably knew where it was to touch it. So mobile phones are ubiquitous and, and uh, used within our society all the time. Next slide. 
So why is a mobile phone the best candidate today to carry a digital virtual credit? Consider a plastic smart card. Um, some people are calling these chip cards. Uh, your, your Visa and MasterCard is carrying a foil chip on it today. And that's what we call a smart card. And they've been storing digital identities on them for decades. The chip is actually a small microprocessor. And that processor has a CPU, it has a memory, it has a crypto engine, it has a key store, it has other elements to it. So if you look at that smartphone and compare it to the um, smart card, it also has a CPU and it also has a, a memory and a crypto engine and key stores and clocks and timers and such. So if you can carry or store a digital identity onto a chip that's on a piece of plastic, you can store the same on a microprocessor that's in a tablet, that's in a phone. Next. Uh, So this isn't some futuristic sci-fi uh, subject. Mobile phones, as we've talked about, everybody's, everybody's got one, and we keep using it more and more. Uh, as Tom was saying, there's an initiative to put your mobile uh, a driver's license onto a mobile phone. We have um, passports that are being uh, stored onto a mobile phone. Um, you can pay for coffee at your local barista uh, using a mobile phone. Um, some people are using mobile phones to uh, interact with vending machines. Next slide. We're also accessing our hotel rooms with our mobile phone. We're accessing our offices in some instances with our mobile phone. And the vision of some companies like my parent company, Asa Aploy, is that Eventually, you will open up your front door and start your car with a mobile phone. It will be the key or the, the identity to the automobile that you own. Next slide. So the first foundation block of storing an identity on a mobile phone is the use of digital certificates and encryption. And this is sometimes a subject that uh, escapes a lot of folks on what a digital certificate is. So consider a certificate hanging on your wall from a university or a training course or your even your marriage certificate. What makes that certificate authentic is the signature of the individual that had the authority to sign it. Well, a digital certificate is very similar. It's only digital. It's not hanging on your wall. So the digital certificate is authenticated by a trusted party called a certificate authority. And then the elements of that digital certificate, such as the public key, the name of the issuer, the owner, and all that, all of that stuff, those are signed, those elements are signed by the CA. And the signature gives that digital certificate the trust and the authority. Next slide. So the second foundation of storing a digital virtual identity onto a phone is um, understanding what, a, what the PKI infrastructure is. So there's PKI or certificate authorities are trusted secure organizations, sometimes referred to as root CA. These CAs will create numerous policies. And then the policy defines the process and the procedure to create the trust. And then issuing certificate authorities will use the policy to generate these digital certificates that I was just talking about in the last slide. So you can generate a certificate for smart cards using one policy, and then you can issue a certificate for cell phones using a, another policy, or you could use a um, policy to, uh, the CA could use a policy to put a certificate on a device that's on the identity of thing, uh, the internet of things. So you've got a root CA creates a policy and then the issuing certificate authorities use that policy.
policy that's all the way back to the root CA. Next slide. And the third foundation is cryptography. And there's two types of cryptographic keys, symmetrical and asymmetrical. So the best way I have found to understand this, because I had to wrap my brain around it at one time, was the use of a door analogy, a front door analogy. So if you have a symmetrical key for your front door, that key can, you, can be used to lock and unlock the door. Next slide. Maybe the next slide, there you go. <laughs> so the, the, um, if you give that key or a copy of that key to your neighbor, that neighbor can lock and unlock the door, come and go. Next slide. In cryptography, maybe the next slide. And the next slide. Okay, good. So in cryptography, using a symmetrical key pair means that it's it's fast encryption. But the uh, downside of symmetrical key pairs is if you lose the key, if you gave that neighbor the key and then he lost it, you'd have to recut your brass key. In cryptography, it's the same. If you lose the key, you have to then change all the keys that were used, being used. So uh, next slide, please. So in, in asymmetrical key, it's, a, it's two different pairs, it's two different keys. One's called a public key, one's called a private key. They're unique to each other. The public key can do uh, only one task, like de-encrypt an email, where the public key can create the email. So if you think about, I, uh, next slide, please. So if you think about our door analogy, um, if you had a key that could only lock the door and you gave it and you gave the uh, public key to your neighbor to unlock the door, that's all they could do is unlock the door. So in, um, in cryptography, when you're sending a, um, uh, an email and you've um, secured it using asymmetrical cryptography, you create the message with your private key and you send it to the um, person you wanna read that message with the public key. And all he can do or she can do is decrypt the message using the public key. Next slide. And next slide. We'll get, keep, keep hitting until we're out of this automation. Thank you. So in physical access, we use cryptography. Typically and traditionally, the cryptography in physical access has been uh, symmetrical key pairs, where the key uh, is on the card and is known by the reader. There is certificate-based physical access control systems where they employ the, uh, a public and private key pair, um, and it enables uh, the value of that is it enables a federation. Uh, next slide. The biggest example of that federation is the United States government. So they have created a card for every employee of the United States government, whether they're civilian or DOD, and that uh, card uses the same PKI cryptography as an asymmetrical cryptography. There's 5.5 million active cards available today. And commercial uh, entities are discovering that they can use the same cryptography and the same PKI at a fraction of the cost because they can create a card using this cryptography, but they don't have to go through the heavy vetting. Like they don't have to go through the policy, if you will, that the United States government uses. They can set up their own policy, but still use the, uh, the PKI infrastructure. And then certificate-based credentials also enable the ability to drive that credential onto a mobile phone or actually create a virtual smart card 
and place it on the mobile phone directly. Next slide. So with that, with all of that physical access control uh, use cases I've talked about in, in cryptography, I'm gonna hand this over to John Fessler, who's gonna talk about the logical side of this presentation. Great, thanks, Neil. And as with your presentation, we're gonna start my presentation with a survey. So if you could answer these survey questions and we'll see where people are uh, relative to derived credentials for logical access. I must say I was surprised to see 40% of the people had already deployed a mobile or derived credential for physical access. That was a much higher number than I had expected. I, I agree with that, John. <laughs> survey says. Okay, so a little less. 19% uh, have already deployed and about another 30-ish percent are looking to deploy in the next 12 to 24 months and uh, 52 are not planning to deploy. Great. All right, so um, I, I'm actually surprised at the 19%. <laughs> that's higher than I would have expected as well. So um, that's great to hear and uh, looking forward to people's feedback if they have any on, on what issues they've encountered when they've already deployed those. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to talk about in terms of logical access was the best practice for logical access. Hit the next slide for me, Devin. Um, and it's probably gonna come as a shock to most of you that the best practice for logical access is not what I'm showing here, but it's what, which is what we use all the time, which is username and password. So next slide. The best uh, practice for uh, logical access is in fact what, what we talked about on the next slide, which is multi-factor authentication. And so, uh, next slide, please, Evan. The multi-factor authentication involves uh, using two or even three of the following. Uh, something that you have, uh, be that a card, uh, like your PIV or CAC card, or your uh, ATM card, or in as is the case for this presentation, could be a phone, could be a USB token, uh, like Yubico or YubiKey, combined with something that you know, and that could be a PIN or a password, uh, to try and prevent somebody from just taking your your object and using it themselves, and then potentially also combined with something that you are a biometric, be that your face or your fingerprint or your voice, and we're probably all familiar with that for from use on our mobile devices. But even better than just uh, multi-factor authentication is multi-factor authentication combined uh, with PKI. Next slide, please where, uh, and I won't go through PKI because Neil's already done that for me and I stole a couple of his little graphics there. <laughs> um, but uh, by using PKI, you not only get the benefits of the multi-factor authentication, but you get some of the security benefits that PKI gives you that ver allows you to verify that the identity of the credential was issued by the proper issuing agency, uh, that it hasn't been changed or cloned since it was issued, and other things like non-repudiation, so you can know whether or not, uh, so you can go back in time and say, oh, well, I know that this person performed this action because they used three-factor authentication in order to do it. And so um, it was not done by some uh, third party, it was done by you. Next slide, please. And so the way you normally do PKI with multi-factor authentication is that the thing you have, in this case, I'm showing it as a smart card, stores the key. And again, I've stolen Neil's key and put it inside my card there. And it's stored inside a tamper-proof container. And its job is to protect that key, keep it private, keep it safe, and not let anybody uh, take it. And then you use either the thing you know or the thing you are or both to unlock access to that private key. So then you can use uh, the key that's stored in the thing that you have uh, to, to do things. Next slide, please. The most common uh, example for this, is, Neil already mentioned, is the five and a half million uh, cards in use by the U.S. government with the Department of Defense, which has been using it for over 20 years, and the federal government uh, came on board about 10 years ago with, with their PIV program. And implementing this system immediately resulted in just a massive reduction in the number of successful penetrations of government information systems. 
if you knew how often uh, those systems are probed, you may be shocked. <laughs> um, and the, the fact that they're, they're almost constantly, millions of times a day, being probed by, uh, by malicious people trying to get in. The way that that was done uh, by the government with their smart card program was they used the card itself and the uh, processor on the card to generate the public and private key, key pair. And then the private key got locked away on the card, never to ever leave it. And then the public key gets put into the publicly available certificate that is then uh, available for everybody to see, and which is signed by the issuing agency. And then you use either your PIN and or your fingerprint to unlock this private key inside the card to do what you need to do, uh, be that log on to your machine, uh, via a challenge response authentication, or to sign and encrypt emails, that kind of stuff. Next slide. And this system has, has been great and has been hugely successful, but it's just not super convenient to use with mobile devices. And we're here today to talk about mobile devices, which isn't to say that you can't use a card with a mobile device. Uh, I'm showing here a, a snapshot from a video that we produced as a part of a project that's ongoing that we're, uh, we at Exponent are working on with the Department of Homeland Security. And this portion of it, what we're using is a mobile device, pretty much as a reader, uh, to authenticate to uh, the next generation uh, common access card uh, by entering the PIN number to it and then doing the challenge response from the phone over the NFC interface to the, the card. Works like a champ, but it's just not super convenient. You don't want to have to, you know, in this case you see he was using two, two hands to hold, one to hold the card to the phone, the other to do the operations on the phone. It's just not convenient enough. People would much prefer to have a mobile identity directly on their phone, so you have one hand operation and just use the phone itself. And so what we're gonna talk about for the remainder of the talk is the way that you can do this and how people have done it already to do a number of things from web access to enterprise application um, to other applications. Next slide, please. And the first thing I wanted to talk about is FIDO. FIDO uh, is an acronym that stands for Fast Identity Online, and it's a consortium of companies and organizations that's dedicated to providing a, a, a new way to log on. Basically, they want to kill the username and the password, which we uh, applaud them for, um, but they still want it to be uh, simple and convenient for people to use, but much safer and more secure. And so they have two different ways to do it. Uh, one is a two-factor authentication method, but I'm going to talk about their uh, Universal Authentication Framework, or UAF, which generally involves uh, a device. And as you can see here, this is a, a, a screen capture taken from their website. On the left there, you see a device that could be a tablet or a mobile device, and it shows little keys on it. And that's because the device is the thing, as I mentioned before, that's uh, storing the keys securely. And then on the right, you see four different biometric modes, uh, fingerprint, uh, iris, facial, and voice. That would be your biometric modes that would unlock that key so that you can use it. Next slide, please. And the way it works for FIDO, it, it's really an interesting concept. And it, it's one that uh, it provides a unique combination of security with ease of use, which are two things that are sometimes mutually exclusive. Uh, as well as privacy, which is also something that can frequently be uh, exclusive of security. So it's a, a great combination of security, privacy, and ease of use. So the way it works is for every website you go to, be it your Amazon.com or your uh, local public library or whatever, you generate a separate public and private key pair for that particular website for yourself. And then you store your private keys on a keychain in your mobile device. It could be in the secure element or on the native key store. Or, um, and then you unlock those keys with your biometric. And so that every time you log on to the website, instead of just doing a username and password, you would authenticate yourself using a challenge response, using the public private key pair for that site. And like I mentioned, it, it has this uh, interesting combination of security, privacy, and ease of use. Because uh, due to these, these features, of the independent keys for the different websites, the first thing is that it makes it a lot uh, more difficult to do cross-site tracking. And uh, so, because you have a different identity for every website you go to. 
Also, I, I do want to point out that even though this is a talk on mobile identity, it actually does not do any identity vetting of you. It provides no assurance of identity. All it does is assure that the person who logs in the second time is pretty likely to be the person who logged in the first time. And so you can set up anonymous uh, identities here and, not, uh, and have no identity information whatsoever, only assure that the, the person who is subsequently uh, logging in is, is likely to be the, the person who initially set it up because you've got the device with the keys and you have the biometric that was used to initially uh, set up the access. Next slide, please. On the flip side to that are uh, enterprise applications. For enterprise or even government applications, you really want to know uh, the identity of the person who's logging on. You don't want people to be setting up um, anonymous uh, accounts with your website. And so you probably want to use something different than FIDO. And uh, historically, what's been used uh, by the DND and others is, uh, you know, smart card-based uh, applications with readers. That's my uh, smiling face there on my uh, common access card sticking into the reader that's connected to my computer. And you can use that to encrypt messages, sign messages, access your corporate uh, resources, etc. Works like a champ. Next slide, please. And it's highly secure. But again, not super convenient. Um, you don't want to have to hold your card up every time in order to send uh, or sign an email. And, but as I say for FIDO, you really want to know that only the authorized users are accessing your system. And so this has led to the development of standards for derived credentials, where we use your existing card-based credential, which has had the appropriate level of identity vetting that's appropriate for your organization. And so we take this as a trust anchor and say, I've got this, I've already got this credential that um, has been issued by a valid authority. My identity has been vetted. Why not use that as my trust anchor and then derive a second software one that I stored on my mobile device? And I could store that either inside an app uh, or on the native key store or inside the hardware secure element. Next slide. And so we use this root of trust, and so you have to have the ID that you're that you already uh, had that was vetted, and you have to prove that it's uh, that you are the person who has it. So you have to have the original credential, and you have to prove that you're the rightful card holder with either the PIN or the biometric. Again, multi-factor authentication. You may need both, or you may even need to do it in person with another person watching that indeed uh, it's your finger that's being uh, put onto the mobile device and not some. Uh, facsimile of your finger, depending on the level of assurance it desired. And then and only then can you generate your new drives credential that would be linked uh, to the original one and stored on the device. Next slide. And if you want some guidance on, on how to do this, uh, NIST has published uh, special publication 800-157. And if you saw the first webinar in this series, uh, on uh, creating an identity. There's quite a bit more information on this. So I won't go into too much more detail on this. You can go back to the stored one and the, the second of the presentations there uh, talked all about derived PIV credentials. But I do want to point out that just because this is a government publication and it provides the requirements that must be used by the government, this still provides good best practices even for non-governmental uses. It talks about things like the life cycle, issuance, maintenance, the technical requirements, what level of cryptography you should be using, what your certificate should look like, and it provides even uh, examples of best practice issuance processes that you can use at non-governmental uh, organizations to assure that you're doing things in accordance with the best practice as vetted by NIST over, over many years of, of study and improvement. Next slide, please. And once you've got your credential on the phone, you can do uh, lots of different things with it. Uh, you could use it just to access your websites from your phone. Or here's an example of something that's, uh, again, part of the work that we're doing at Exponent with the Department of Homeland Security, where we're using the fact that because your identity is on a phone and phones have ways to communicate with other phones like NFC or Bluetooth, you could do peer-to-peer -peer authentication. So this is an example where we have two phones. Each of them have an identity stored on them. 
uh, and you, you can imagine one person coming up to another person, maybe at a uh, uh, at a uh, entrance facility or a, a turnstile or a, a secured perimeter, and one person says, "I'd like to get let in," and the other person says, "Well, let me check who you are." And you hold your phones up to one another, and we use the, the opacity protocol, which is a, a method of rapidly setting up uh, secure encrypted communication between the two devices, which happens in about a third of a second. Set up that, and then over an encrypted channel now, over NFC, you can send information back and forth and do a challenge response between these two um, identities that have been provisioned onto these two uh, devices. And you can get uh, uh, secure, uh, authenticated, and encrypted authentication between these peer-to-peer -peer devices in, in just a matter of a second or two. Next slide. And my final slide is really just to say, once you've got this uh, credential on your device, there's really no limit to what you could use it for. You could use it, a sense, you could use it for IoT. Here's an example from Toshiba of using uh, their mobile device with a credential on it to go up to a uh, copy machine that's got a, um, that wasn't NFC enabled, but they've stuck a, an NFC enabled uh, micro SD card into it. And now you're using a mobile device with a credential to authenticate to some sort of uh, connected device uh, over NFC. You could use it for cloud access. Essentially, you can use it for anything that you use uh, username and password for and generating a, a more user-friendly and yet uh, more secure experience for everyone. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you uh, very much, John, and, and also uh, Neil for that uh, great presentation. Um, we're going to have a few minutes left so we can take some of your questions. If you haven't submitted uh, a question yet, um, please do so now and, and enter them on the desktop uh, uh, application there for the, for the GoToWebinar. Um, before we actually start asking those questions, uh, if we could advance to the next slide, I just wanted to um, make people aware that there is a number of quality um, resources available on the Secure Technology Alliance website. Uh, you can find that by um, either following the links here on your screen or um, going to the Secure Technology uh, Alliance website and clicking on the Knowledge Center, and that will give you access to uh, a number of uh, resources organized by different subjects and topics. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. Um, first question uh, is for Neil. Um, so you were talking about asymmetric key pair use. Um, on a mobile device, does that require that the mobile device have access to data? And what happens if your phone loses coverage? Well, it doesn't, the last part of it, it doesn't uh, require um, wireless uh, or connectivity to do the um, authentication because the digital keys are in the phone. So if you're, if you're uh, presenting your mobile phone to say um, your laptop, um, the digital, the encryption is being done in the phone. So you don't have to have connectivity. And, and the first part of that question again, Randy? Um, does, does using uh, asymmetric key pairs on a mobile device require um, mobile data, access to mobile data? I think you answered that, yeah. Yeah, no it doesn't. I mean, what what you do is you're using a something called a credential management system to uh, put the digital certificate onto the phone, uh, but there is no back-end mobile data that's being shared with that phone when you're doing uh, authentication into a into a reader or into a portal. Okay. Uh, next question is for John. Um, the device-to-device -device authentication that Exponent described, is it based on the FIDO protocol between the two devices and so that the user can be authenticated? It is not. It is uh, actually based on the secure messaging protocol that's in 
NIST uh, Special Publication 873. So it uses the opacity, pro which is what's used for uh, the PIV program. And so it uses opacity to uh, set up an encrypted communication channel between the two and then does the, uh, uh, the challenge response uh, there and then following up on the previous question, we've we've designed that to also work in an offline situation. Uh, most of the situations that that people ask us about are situations like tactical environments where you might need to use a phone where you don't have back end communication. So we've been developing it all along, uh, assuming no back end communication. The only problem if you don't have back end communication is you you can't go and do a real time verification of the certificate to make sure that it hasn't been revoked. So you'd have to have some sort of like uh, offline uh, certificate revocation list or whitelist or blacklist or something like that. Okay, excellent. Um, next question um, is also to, uh, to you, John. Um, what software is required to create a derived credential on a phone? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, you can create certificates yourself and, and just inject them on there. And so for our demonstration purposes, we've, uh, we just create uh, certificates ourselves. Really what you need to do, if, you, if but those are sort of fake temporary ones for demonstration purposes. You need something that can go, uh, you need a credential management system type software, um, type of stuff that Neil's company sells. Um, to deal with moving back to the uh, issuing agencies and certificate authorities if you want to have those credentials, do the full PKI and get the certificates posted uh, so, so that others could access the, the public portions of them. Okay, can I can I take a whack at that? If, if you, yeah, go ahead. yeah, please. So if you think about uh, printing a plastic card, you've got a credential management system that John just talked about who's putting together that identity and then sending that identity to the encoder on a printer who's going to encode that identity onto that chip and then print the card. You do the same thing when you're doing a mobile uh, credential, only it's not being printed, it's being pushed to the, to the uh, microprocessor on the mobile phone. Okay. Um, Next question, uh, maybe e either John or Neil for this one. Um, in reference to FIDO, this is, um, to clarify, does FIDO provide verification of a person's identity and what do you need to actually implement the FIDO solution? I'll take that one, I guess. Uh, it, correct, it does not do any identity verification whatsoever. You can set up an account with whomever, any way you want, under what name. Um, if you have to pay for things, then obviously you're going to have to put a credit card in there. Um, but uh, if you're not paying for things, which is accessing some sort of online uh, resource, there's a, no identity verification whatsoever. In order to implement the second half of that question, in order to implement a FIDO solution, you need three things. Uh, you need what's called an authenticator. That's the thing that determines uh, whether or not e either someone is uh, present or that their second factor is present or does the biometric matching. And then you need a server and you need a client. And so with those three things, you can implement a, a FIDO uh, solution. And the good news is, is that the, the FIDO Alliance has a certification program. And so they have, I just checked uh, recently, last, last time I checked there are 476 FIDO uh, certified products on that list. So hundreds of each of those uh, things, authenticator, server, and client. So you can put them together and, and be assured that they've gone through FIDO's uh, process for certification. This, this next question is to Neil. Uh, it's based on the, the physical access use case. Um, can a digital certificate based credential, I guess on a phone, be used with any packs to open a physical door? Uh, no, uh, what you would need to do is uh, enable the PAC system to be able to recognize the digital certificate. And if you're using a uh, FIPS 201 
format that the federal government has developed, um, that infrastructure is already built. You just would have to purchase it. Uh, I would believe that probably next year um, the PAC systems will be able to read other digital certificates as the use cases become a little bit more popular. Okay. Uh, next question. Um, well, next question was, uh, can a derived credential on a phone be used for logical access? Um, John, I think you mentioned that use case. Could you talk about that? I would say yes. <laughs> yep, that's absolutely what, uh, what it can be used for. And, and the primary, uh, if that didn't come across, I failed. But uh, yeah, so the, the main purpose of putting a derived credential on a phone is to for logical access for your, um, your online uh, resources. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about what has to be enabled on the application side of the resource that you're accessing in order to accept the uh, credential. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're, what you're going to need to do is have um, uh, something equivalent to a smart card login uh, type resource available to you that would be able to do the challenge response and go back and do the, uh, you know, maybe if you're looking at some sort of Microsoft thing, you need the Microsoft uh, uh, version of that uh, in order to access that in a, in a similar way. So it basically, you, it, it would act like a virtual smart card that's residing on your phone as opposed to connecting to a smart card that's plugged into an external reader. So you need probably Active Directory type stuff. Okay, uh, question about government usage of uh, derived credentials. How much adoption or implementation of derived credentials has been done up to date in the U.S. government? I could, I'll start with that. I don't know if Neil has any input, but. There's huge demand for it in the government. Um, the people want it. They want to be using their phones remotely. Um, the higher ups are, are demanding it and saying, I don't understand why I can do everything in my life with my iPhone except my work here at the US government. And so they're, they're working with the new standards that are coming out and issuing them. Um, I, know, uh, I don't know all of the agencies, but I do have some numbers for a couple of them. I know uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, the XTech has been issuing uh, quite a few. They've done about 55,000 derived credentials in the last year. And uh, the Department of Defense has uh, a program called Purebred, where they uh, issue derived credentials to phones. And this data is probably a little dated, but back in 2016, I know they were issuing um, a few thousand of them, two to 3,000 credentials per month to people, but it involves people going in and bringing their phones and um, issuing on to them. So they haven't yet gotten to a point where people can derive their own um, credentials uh, on their mobile devices from their own, um, from their own uh, physical credentials. It's still something that involves a, a, an issuance process. And so the, the numbers are, are, you know, are not as high as I think people would like them to be. Yeah, I'd agree with that, John. Percentages are still slow. It's still low. And Neil, just as a follow-up for my information, have you seen any um, any take up in the commercial non-government space? For a derived credential? Yes, please. Uh, not not. We've seen some movement, um, and we do have some. Folks that have looked at a either a drive credential or a I don't know I'll, I'll invent this term a virgin smart card onto a mobile phone uh, that doesn't use a secondary or a, a first uh, credential, um, but there isn't a um, you know there isn't anyone that has deployed that in in a large quantity. Okay, um, so this question is a little bit uh, long. Um, 
it has to do with SIM cards and mobile devices, uh, which have chips on them um, that are personalized and secured, uh, in, and are used to secure mobile devices for for many years. Um, question is about eSIMs, uh, which are integrated circuits that are surface mounted onto a device's circuit board, um, which seem to be gaining rapid adoption. Will eSIMs on mobile devices change or influence the process uh, you described today? Uh, Neil, do you think you can answer that one, or John? That's probably over my pay grade, uh, because that's more of a manufacturer of mobile phone devices. Uh, we use the TPM that's on the phones um, today. That's what enables our ability or that enables the ability to put the digital certificate on the phone, but I'm not too sure what the um, future uh, with SIMs and eSIMs are. John, do you have any comment on that? Uh, yeah, I think I'm in the same boat as you, Neil. I'm not exactly sure how they're going to go with that, but you know, my I always advocate storing these things in hardware, if at all possible, in in some sort of secure element that's in the phone, and um, you know, SIMs have that. Um, but you don't necessarily and almost never have access to those, your SIM card to store other things because it's owned by your mobile network operator. And so you have to use other hardware that's in the phone. So I think it would be a question as to whether or not the eSIMs allowed access to other third party applications to store things in them. Okay. Uh, well, it looks like we are at the top of the hour, and we won't be able to answer any additional questions. Uh, if we could just go to the last slide. Um, so I just wanted to remind folks that, um, that this webinar um, has been recorded, and uh, attendees will receive an email communication from us uh, probably tomorrow or the next day uh, with uh, the link to the uh, recording of the webinar and also be able to access the, the resources. Um, please feel free to share that with other colleagues uh, who were not able to participate today. Um, want to thank again our uh, panelists, Tom Lockwood, uh, for your leadership of the Identity Council and helping organize this, this webinar. It was terrific. And to uh, Neil Fallon from HID Global and uh, Dr. John Fessler from Exponent for your, for your great content. Thank you all uh, audience for, for uh, participating and sharing with us today on this, this webinar. And uh, please be on the lookout for um, webinar number three, which is coming up um, on mobile devices for ease of use around payment integrity. So thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Webinar is now concluded. Thank you.